Welcome to the Mindset Game Podcast. I am delighted to have Carolyn Coughlin with us today. Carolyn is a co-founder, director, and board co-chair of Cultivating Leadership, a leadership consultancy whose mission is to help leaders and organizations thrive in complexity. She is the co-author of the Unleash Your Complexity Genius, Growing Your Inner Capacity to Lead an expression of her decades of passion and practice with developing approaches that help leaders to find and grow their inner capacity to lead in a complex world. Carolyn designs and runs leadership programs. She works with teams and she coaches leaders at all levels based on these approaches. She is also the co-founder and a lead facilitator of Growth Edge Coaching and as well as being the co-founder of the Growth Edge Network and is on the faculty of the Institute of Transformational Learning at Georgetown University. And I'm so delighted and grateful to have you here with us, Carolyn, because this topic of uh, unleashing our complexity genius is so relevant and important these days. And I'm really excited for our listeners to learn from you because I know it will be very helpful for them. So thank you. Thank you, Barrett. I'm really happy to be here. So why don't we j- jump right into what, what do you mean by unleashing our complexity, complexity genius? What does that mean? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the idea is that, um, that we are actually built as human beings. We are designed to manage quite well in complexity. And by complexity, what I mean, that word gets thrown a lot around a lot these days. What I mean specifically by complexity is um, any situation that you find yourself in um, that you really can't predict and control, not because you just haven't been smart enough to figure it out yet, but because it's actually not predictable or controllable. <clears throat> and, and um, you know, in nature, we have, uh, we see uh, complexity all the time in the interconnection um, of, you know, species and uh, in, in ecosystems, right? You can't actually um, see all the interconnections of how one thing affects another, but you can see patterns over time. Um, and this is what, you know, weather forecasters are on about, like they're trying to predict the unpredictable. Um, and they do pretty well some of the time because they, there are patterns that are, um, that are observable over time. But you can't predict in any one moment what's exactly going to happen. And um, so the sorts of complex systems that we are most um, uh, interested in as leaders, as leadership development specialists, as executive coaches, as you know, whatever you happen to be, if you're listening to this podcast, uh, are human systems. And human systems are super complex, even though sometimes we think we can control other people and groups of people and how people behave. Um, really, um, we know if we're really honest with ourselves that most of the time we can't. So we have this genius in us. Um, and this is, this is part of the premise of the book, um, for thriving and complexity, right? Um, we seek it out. We seek out relationships, um, which are endlessly complex. We have children, uh, anyone who's ever raised children understands that even though we would like to be able to predict and control, we really can't. And um, we, you know, we, we love sporting events. Sporting events would not be interesting if they were predictable or controllable. We love these things. Um, and yet when we are in the midst of kind of complexity that often, which often feels like overwhelm um, or uncontrollability or out of controlness, um, when that happens to us, we it, it, exactly the moment when we need when we need the genius that we have in us innately to deal with it, we sort of lose our ability to have access to it. So instead of tapping into our innate ability to um, to connect, to experiment, to um, watch and see what happens and act accordingly, we instead try to double down and uh, control things, and we rely on our ability to figure things out. We try to bring in more resources. We try to do all kinds of things to sort of manage, manage complexity, right? Or wrestle it to the ground. And, um, and this is the thing we're talking about in the book that we want to bring back online our natural genius, 
for dealing with complexity so that we can be more effective, but also honestly, just more, just happier as, a, as individuals and as a species. I mean, geez, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of stress and overwhelm that happens and um, we don't really need to create more for ourselves. So that's what we need. You're absolutely right. And and I think we've all been there where there is that overwhelm and we can't quite predict what's gonna happen. We may need to make some decisions that impact people and uh, and, and it, it could be a lot for the system. And so it is natural to go out and as you said, try to control or defend or, you know, and and so what you're suggesting, uh, I sense here, is going inward, which which can seem really tough because you know you you have pressure to to make stuff happen to solve a problem, and so what what exactly are you suggesting for us to do in those times of distress? Mm. Well, there are many things, and some of them involve going inward, and some of them involve actually going outward and, and connecting with um, with our environment around us, with other people, and you know those show up in the. We might talk about these, but the geniuses of of wonder and um, the geniuses, especially the genius of love, which is my favorite. Um, but we need to start by the, the the first genius is is noticing. It's the genius of noticing, like to be able to notice both what in that moment of um, when we are automatically reacting and doubling down and trying to control, to be able to notice what's happening inside of us and also what's happening outside of us. So it really is, it's the most, in some ways, mundane thing in the world. <laughs> like, you know, what, what do you do? Well, you notice, you stop and you're able to identify, direct your attention to what's actually happening. Because if we don't notice what's happening, then we just go on autopilot and, um, and keep doing the, what we do. So that's the first thing that we're suggesting is that we have to stop and be able to see what's happening um, in the moment. And then, um, and then we have the opportunity to do something different. So how do we notice? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, because just at the moment when you're not noticing, how do you suddenly like develop the habit of you know, like bring online the habit of noticing? I think um, this is why learning about things like complexity, about the fact that we have these geniuses in us, learning about what um, what sorts of things tend to uh, throw us into our sort of um, blind heads down trying to control things. Um, we, so we first, uh, if, if we learn about what's happening, that's the first step, right? So being able to even name what complexity is um, and what it's not, um, that's a helpful start. To be able to name and get familiar with the sorts of situations that tend to trigger us in some way, right? So for me, um, when, uh, you know, one of my um, triggers is when uh, too many people seem to be asking too many things of me all at once. Okay. That's a big trigger for me. Why? Because I see myself as a person who is kind and attentive to other people and um, not focused on myself, but focused on helping and meeting other people, you know, in their needs and all that kind of stuff. So when I when just, this is just my thing, you'll have a different one, each listener, but, um, but to recognize my triggers. Um, and so when I notice that I'm either, because my responses to that are either to try to do everything. First, I try to do everything and meet everybody's needs. And then when it gets too much, then I just put up these big walls and um, try to block everybody out and everything out. So it'd be, you know, I recognize that pattern in myself and then I develop the habit of stopping and breathing and trying to calm my nervous system a little bit so that I have different choices. Um, and so understanding what's going on, even though it's not enough, it's a first step it, to be able to do something different. Um, so that's, that's one way. 
uh, and practice, practice, practice is the other thing and practice in company. So having people who will help us notice when we're falling into a pattern um, that maybe isn't so helpful. So yeah, there are a couple ways. And, and I think that also speaks to the power of coaching uh, because when we can have someone, whether it's a formal or an informal coach, someone that is present with us, um, uh, you know, they can point out, as you said, oh, there is that pattern, or at least make us aware of a blind spot, because we might not even be conscious of, of a pattern that's being played out. And and you, you spoke at the beginning of that, of kind of saying the difference between com- what is complexity and what it is not. So well, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, literally, like, uh, by definition, um, complexity means there are many, many interrelated parts, right, that affect each other. Um, And so internally, let's say, if I think of myself as a complex system, um, my, uh, what's happening in my physical body, like right now, my back hurts. Um, If I think that my back is hurting, um, in a vacuum, I'm wrong. It's connected to both my emotional state, it's connected to um, like probably the fact that I don't, you know, my hips are misaligned and so I put, put puts pressure on my back. Um, so it has to do with my emotional state, it has to do with my context, like how I'm sitting, I've been sitting in an uncomfortable chair, um, it has to do with other parts of my body. So as an example, like m- my, self is a complex system because there's the physical parts that are going on. There's my emotional state. There's um, the incoming um, stimuli that are happening. There's my history, um, you know, what's um, how I even take in information. So all those things. And then um, a human system is also complex because now you've got all these little complex systems um, interacting with each other. And there are so many interconnections that you can't um, you can't possibly predict what's going to happen at any moment. How one interaction over here is going to affect something over here. Um, I once had a we were teaching about complexity at a um, at a tech company, and we had a, an engineer say, "I think I could write an algorithm for that." And uh, by by definition, you can't really write an algorithm for to that would take care of any possible thing that could happen at any time, right? So in complexity, um, not only can you not predict and control because there's so many interconnecting parts and each part is also unpredictable. Um, Whereas in a complicated system, um, like we tend to use the example of like a car engine, right? In a car engine, there are many different parts working together. But once you know how the parts work together, Um, they don't spontaneously change themselves. Um, And you don't, uh, and so you you can, I mean, a car part part might, one part might stop working, but someone who is an expert in that car engine will understand exactly how it's going to affect other things. Um, So you can, you can, they would know how to fix it. So being more expert means you can fix it um, or having the right resources means you can fix it. The other thing about complicated problems is that if it worked one way yesterday, it's almost likely to, it, unless there is some specific change, it'll work that way today and it'll work that way tomorrow. In complex systems, the past is not necessarily a good predictor of the future. So the important thing really here is how our, uh, the way we tend to make sense of things as human beings interacts with complexity in unhelpful ways. Um, and so I said in the beginning, we are wired, we are actually wired for complexity, right? In our, by birthright, but we are conditioned and educated and learned to think that if we're smart enough or work hard enough or have the right experts or do the right analysis, we can figure everything out. So with this mindset, trying to figure out the unfigure outable actually um, wastes a lot of energy and can all, uh, often is anti-helpful because the interventions that we make in a complex system, like in a human system, for example, that are meant to try to figure out and fix and bring more resources to it often have unintended consequences, like, like with children, right? Especially as our kids get older, the more we try to fix them, or this is my experience, um, sometimes the worse things can get. Um, so 
I don't know if that's um, enough, but it's about the degree of predictability and controllability really. Um, and whether working harder or knowing more will help to solve the problem or not. How do we, yeah, thank you. How do we tap into the geniuses? I know you kind of mentioned already a few uh, complexity geniuses, like how do we do that? Um, and, and I guess number one is how do we even realize that we're in a moment where we need to do that? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll start with how do we realize we're in a moment when we might need to do that? Um, it, again, I think pr probably one of the most helpful things is to um, is to begin to notice the patterns. Um, so both what causes like, us getting into a, a place of overwhelm, um, but also what happens in our bodies. So this does take practice, um, but I might notice that begin to practice noticing that my breath gets short, right? That I'm not breathing very deeply or that my shoulders are hunched up like this. This is often why my back starts to hurt, my neck and back start to hurt. Um, and then, uh, then I notice my shoulders are up. Um, and so, um, or you might notice that there's a kind of a niggle in your belly. So coming to our bodies is like, our bodies really don't lie. This is the thing. Um, our bodies do not lie. And often what we experience as um, an emotion, well, I think always what we experience as a thought or an emotion has a counterpart in our bodies. But most of us um, are not really practiced at, at noticing what that is. So um, our bodies can be such a great source of information like, oh, my stomach hurts. Uh, I wonder what's going on there. Um, and our bodies are uh, a great source of intervention. So if my stom stomach hurts and my stomach is tight, I might notice that my shoulders are also tight or I'm not breathing very deeply. So um, it, shifting my state and bringing online um, the part of our nervous system that, that we talk about in the book, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is needed for um, being able to be creative and calm and restored, um, just breathing more deeply out or breathing out longer than we breathe in, for example, is a tiny little move that can bring back on to line our parasympathetic nervous system, which then um, means our body will be doing different things. It won't be in a fight and flight mode. It'll be more in a rest and restore mode. And from a different body, we tend to have different emotions and different thoughts. <clears throat> so this is why um, I talk so much about our bodies as a source of both wisdom and intervention. And it's um, such a simple thing to do. You used the word mundane, you know, earlier. Um, and yet it's something that many of us either forget to do or we dismiss as a truly valuable uh, process, if we can call it that, a thing to do um, in the midst of complexity and distress. Um, so what would you have to say to those individuals that are like, really, Carolyn, like, really, you know, I got this issue, my team, my family, my, you know, friend is experiencing this, I'm experiencing this, like, I don't have time to, you know, begin to notice what's happening in my body and what difference would it make? Like, what, what evidence can you give to them? Uh, to prove that it is well worth their time? Yeah, um, this is such a good question. It reminds me of a time, um, I think it was about eight years ago, we were working with a new client and um, and we were developing a leading and complexity program. And um, I kept pushing for, probably not strongly enough, I'm not sure, for um, having some things in the in the program about noticing and um, and working with our current, like our present moment experience. And this person said to me, seriously, Carolyn, we're gonna teach these very, very smart people about noticing and we're gonna tell them that noticing is an important move in leading in complexity. And I said, yes, <laughs> but it was a hard sell. Um, many years later, I think it's, um, it is more accepted. Um, but so what would I say to these folks now? Um, one, uh, the first thing I would say is, um, 
yeah, it seems like a very, very small thing. And I would wonder, you know, out loud with them, if, if one of, if one of these folks were my coaching client, I would probably really listen to them and, and ask, you know, so what feels at stake for you or what feels hard or what feels wrong about or insufficient about focusing on your own inner experience, your body, when the world is blowing up? You know, I would probably listen in that way and try to meet them where they are. Um, because, geez, you know, the leaders we work with, many of them are facing, you know, huge challenges. So really hearing that this little move of, of noticing and working with your body feels insufficient and perhaps almost selfish or self-oriented or something. Um, it's probably an important first move. Um, and then I would just, and, and many of the coaches listening out there probably do this already, but I would just have, and I do this, ha have them try something. So um, when, you know, I, I hear a lot of coaches these days ask questions like, where do you feel that in your body? Um, for someone, you know, why are we asking that question? The reason I ask that question is because of this idea that, um, that, you know, our thoughts and our feelings, what we say, how we act, all of these things arise from this thing we call our, our, our body, right? All of these things are arising together. And so I would offer that as an idea and then just have them talk about, see if they can identify if they're angry, what, what do they feel in their body right now? And then see if they can create this, like this, this connection between the body sensation and the feeling or the thought, and then practice with shifting, not the thought or the feeling, but the, the thing that's happening in the body. So lower your shoulders. See if you can take a really deep out breath. Um, put your shoulders back a little bit if you're feeling um, contracted. Um, feel your feet, feel the weight of your body, feel gravity. And, um, and over time, just see if this create, creates some kind of different for them, difference for them in terms of how they're able to act. So that's one thing, just try it and see. Um, that's the more direct route. The only other thing I want to say about this is that one of the, a really key concept in complexity, and we talk about this in the book, is this idea of creating the conditions, right? So in the, in the predictable world, we intervene directly to make things happen. In complexity, what you do is you want to create the conditions for the thing that you, sorts of things you want to have happen to happen. So, um, making changes in how your body, what's happening in your body, either by breathing differently or getting more sleep or moving, um, changing your shape. These things are things that don't directly impact other people, but they create the conditions for what's possible. Um, so I might introduce that idea as well. Um, so come at it from both directions, like the, let's just do something in the moment, practice in the moment, and let's talk about why are we doing this? This is the approach I tend to take. Yeah, I think it's so important that you're bringing up this concept of like preparation, right? Like being conscious of some of our patterns uh, in advance, because then we're much more likely to be our choice when, when we're in that moment. Uh, and also just to kind of build that line of communication with the body. What happens when I'm experiencing certain things, like you said, for example, anger, how are my shoulders? How am I breathing? And, and of course, when we find ourselves in those moments to shift and reset, as you said, kind of like whether it's breathing after we notice a kind of a slower out breath um, or shifting or moving or taking actions like getting more sleep. I, I'm, I, I, I really appreciate that you are reminding us of the importance of this. So you also mentioned that we can go outward and I'm really curious, mm -hmm. what do you mean by that? And, and, and what are the results when we do that? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I guess the, the, the most important way that I think of as going outward, um, I mean, is what we call the genius of love, right? There's a concept in complex adaptive systems that, the, the magic really is in the connection between things. 
um, much more so, so possibility for change happens in the connection. And as you heard me describing complexity earlier, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's, um, you never know, there are so many connections and um, you don't know what's connected to what um, and changing one connection can really change um, something in other parts of the system. This is why we talk about love. Um, and we, just, we, we decided to call it love and not just connection because actually in human systems, deep appreciation for and seeing each other can make a huge, huge difference, not only in what's possible for the system itself, but in, um, in individuals, it tends to bring online, again, our parasympathetic nervous system. So um, a bunch of parasympathetic nervous systems connected together um, is much more generative than a bunch of sympathetic nervous systems in fight or flight mode. Um, you know, about butting heads uh, with each other. So um, when I talk about going out, <clears throat> there are many things, but, um, but it, one is, it, sorry, I'm going in two directions at the same time. There are many things, but this thing, this idea of connecting with each other, really seeing each other, developing relationships that are trust-based. This is, um, this is what I mean. And so if we're in a moment of complexity and distress, and maybe the person or persons that we're interacting with in our perception are the cause of the distress, how do we activate love um, in those moments when it's just really hard to feel that? <laughs> uh, yeah. And I want, I want to distinguish between love and agreement, right? Um, we're going to disagree all the time. I mean geez, we are in a, a moment right now in the world really uh, like heightened at this moment in the United States with the midterm elections being tomorrow, um, that where people are, uh, where there's uh, disharmony everywhere, where there's disagreement everywhere, um, and, and where people are shutting off from each other from, from differing views. Um, we are never going to, nor do we want to live in a world where people agree all the time. Um, that actually would decrease our collective capacity to solve the world's problems or to, to make progress on the world's biggest problems, um, even our small problems. But, um, but what we're talking about is actually attempting to connect with each other um, in a way that is truly curious and and seeing each other um and so how do you do that when you're it's really really hard to do that when when you're um when you're triggered when you feel right um when you feel incensed i mean i certainly experienced this myself so um in the case where you don't get to have direct connection with somebody you know like there are plenty of people i disagree with in the world right now um, that I don't, I can't directly connect with because I don't even know them. Um, one practice that we can be in is to simply go into ourselves, like bring that per that person to mind or that viewpoint to mind, and um, and and um, see if we can conjure up some curiosity. Um, and the curiosity might come in the form of questions like, "How do they see themselves? Like, what is it that they are?" a stand for? What is it that they are defending or advocating for in the world? And what does it mean to them? Like most people are the heroes in their own stories, right? Most people are, do think that they're, they're doing right in the world. Sometimes that's hard to believe these days, but to try to just ask ourselves these questions, what do they stand for? What do they care about? Um, so that's, um, that's one way to do it. Um, one of the things I like to do, um, is to just see if I can visualize someone with whom I disagree and um, or really have even more than just disagree but feel quite threatened by and just close my eyes, bring them to mind or bring the set of ideas to mind and just see if I can grow like this. This is more of a sensation practice. See if I can grow some sort of feeling of love or if love is too hard, then at least compassion um something and um 
there is no guarantee that that is going to change your opinion. It probably won't, but it does give your um, body, the ex- our bodies, the experience of more love. Um, so those are, and it's hard. Gee, it's hard, Varad. I mean, like it is really, really hard. So it's just a practice. It's not a, a magic solution. Thank you for just um, reminding us of our humanity and other people's humanity and that everyone truly is doing the best that they can. Because I think there's a lot of forgiveness and grace that comes with that for ourselves and for for others and and their behaviors. And would you be willing to perhaps guide us through something for us to experience uh, even more some of the wonderful techniques that you're sharing with us today? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, so let's start, we'll start with noticing. Um, We'll do a little bit of some internal work. And then let's see if we can um, just see if we can amplify love just a little bit. So, so we'll work through all of that. So, um, so if you're listening, um, what I'd like you to do is to bring to mind some situation that feels, now that we've talked about complexity, complexity in human systems, that feels complex in the sense that um, it's, it's, it's not resolvable, it hasn't been able to be resolved, it's taking a lot of your attention, um, maybe you've tried to fix it and you haven't been able to, um, and maybe it's something that you've noticed that um, you really wish it would go away, but you also, if you're honest, you know it probably isn't going away. So see if you can bring to mind something like that for you. And may, yeah, maybe close your eyes. Barrett, I see you're closing your eyes. I also tend to close my eyes when I, when I do this um, because what I'm gonna ask you now is to just go inside. Um, one little technique I love Um, because it's kind of playful, is to imagine that your eyeballs are turn around 180 degrees. So they're actually looking inside of you. So imagine you can actually look into your inner experience um, first with your eyes, just have a look around. And as you have brought to mind this situation that feels complex to you, See if you can have a look around and see what's happening in your body, right? Where do you see tightness? And if the eyes don't work for you, by the way, you might want to, if you're better to go directly to the, to what you're feeling physically, like the realm of your sensations, please do that as well. Um, what are you noticing in your body? body? Are you noticing maybe your heart is beating quickly? Maybe your throat is constricted. Maybe you notice a lot of activity up in your head, right? way up in your head. Maybe you feel like you're floating above the ground, like whatever it is for you, just give it, just scan. Scan with your eyes, scan your sensations. Maybe you hear something, maybe you smell something. What's going on? For me, I notice um, when I bring to mind this challenge that, Gosh, this is interesting. My, um, I noticed first of all that I put my hands together and I start to sort of wring my hands. <laughs> and I notice that uh, my heart is beating kind of quickly and that my shoulders are forward, right? So I have a body that is kind of uh, constricted, right? Because by squeezing my hands, my shoulders are forward and my heart is racing. So the first thing, I'm going to ask you to do is see if you can find something that's happening in your body that you would like to shift somehow. So for me, I'm going to pull my hands apart and I'm going to see if I can find some softness in my hands. So they're not creating tension, 
by squeezing together, which they were doing before. And I'm also going to bring my shoulders back just a little bit, not in a, not in a kind of a forced way, but just see if I can create better alignment um, for the air to move through my body, for the fresh oxygen to come in. And so that then I can breathe out the CO2 well. Right, so just create, I'm, I'm creating a body, a shape here that is more conducive to, um, to really telling the signaling to my parasympathetic nervous system that everything is okay. I, I don't have to be defended here. I can be open and free flowing. So just notice what you're doing, what little movement you can make to shift in your shape. Or maybe it's your breath. These two, I call these two things, our breath and movement, they are direct access to our nervous systems. These are the two geniuses that are actually tapping directly into our nervous system. Okay, so now that you have a more um, a shape, a body that's more conducive to signaling to your parasympathetic nervous system that everything is okay. You don't have to be in fight or flight mode. A body that air can move through more freely. See if you can bring to mind, maybe you want to visualize someone, or maybe it's an idea, but let's it'll make it easier if it's a someone um, inside your challenge that you find um, activates your sympathetic nervous system, the, the, the fight or flight mode. But just bring that person to mind and notice what happens in your body. Notice what happens. For me, it almost automatically triggers my sympathetic nervous system. It makes my heart speed up, makes my breathing go shallower. And boy, did I want to clench my hands together. Okay, so now with that person in mind and noticing what happens in your body, see if you can, again, um, do whatever shifts you need to make in your body to tell your body that you don't have to be on the defensive. You don't have to be in fight or flight mode. And then see if you can, with this person in mind, imagine a, a stream of like, energy um, between you and that person, right? See if you can imagine an actual connection between you. I like to imagine a kind of a stream of light going out from my chest and connecting to theirs. So, so visualize a connection between you and this other person. And on your end of the connection, in your chest, see if you can maybe do something that, um, that, that, that increases the positive connection between you and that person. So for me, I like to imagine that this stream of energy is connected directly to my heart. And then I actually visualize my heart starting to just grow. You can do that might not work for you. There might be something else for you, but something on your end, infusing whatever feels like love to you into this connection between you and the other person. And then send it out, send it out this positive regard, this thing that feels like love, or compassion and see if you can visualize it moving along this stream of connection, energetic connection between you and this person and finding its way all the way there. Just what we're doing here is we're amplifying love. And on the other end is this person who has a whole life this person stands for something. This person has values. Just see if you can begin to just tap into some of that, them as a whole person and not just a person who somehow 
triggers this defensive response in you. Just stay with that for another moment. And then notice what's happening in your body right now. I notice that mine is leaning forward. And I notice that my shoulders are not compressed forward. They're actually back. I actually feel my heart, um, my chest forward, open. And then just before you open your eyes, if your eyes are closed, uh, before you leave this moment, like take a little snapshot of this, right? You don't have to go through being led by me for whatever it was, three, four minutes um, to create this connection. You can do this with practice. You can just do this automatically. Um, just like anything that we practice over and over again. So that's one practice. There are many wow. others. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I followed your instructions and uh, definitely feel a lot more ease around some tension that showed up last night when I heard something. So I'm so grateful this was perfect and you just guided us so beautifully. And uh, I sense that those individuals listening or watching that that followed your instructions and did the process and gave themselves permission to feel and to connect, uh, that they too experienced a shift uh, mentally, emotionally, perhaps physically, or all of the above. So thank you. You're welcome. And I just, you know, I just want to offer here, Vera, that... Um, you know, on one level, you could, you know, your listeners could be interpreting this as, um, okay, so I feel better, but nothing has changed. <laughs> um, and that, you know, that may be true, right? At a minimum, um, uh, when we activate our complexity genius, it helps us to be more centered and grounded. And um, speaking of creating the conditions, for what we want from a different body, from a different nervous system, different things are possible. And honestly, the more influence one has in the world, the more important this is. So those of you who are leaders or coaching leaders, um, I would just not underestimate how much impact um, a different body with a lot of power and influence, a different nervous system with a lot of power and influence can have in the world. Um, and so these seem like, may seem like small moves and they are, they're very small moves and they can unlock. And um, when we unleash complexity genius, we can unlock a lot of possibilities that, that, um, that are hard to, to, um, to access when we are locked in um, our reactions to overwhelm and trying to, um, trying to avoid complexity or trying to wrestle it to the ground. This has been such a beautiful, important conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. How, <laughs> how can we learn even more? Carolyn, I think uh, I, I imagine that people listening have had some experience and they're curious to connect even more with themselves and of course with others. How do we learn from you? Um, well, I guess the first thing I would say is um, if you haven't, um, please check out our book, Unleash Your Complexity Genius. It's, um, it's really not long. It's, um, it, it's a very digestible and very accessible. And so um, I really suggest that. Um, go to our website too, cultivatingleadership.com. We have uh, about 80 colleagues and many of them write really, really cool blogs. I mean, you can see what we're up to, what, how we're applying this work, our work in complexity, adult development and 
um, and related fields, how we're applying it in um, you know, diversity, inclusion, and belonging work, um, how we're um, working in organizations. There's just a lot of really good stuff there, a lot of great resources. So I would, um, yeah, encourage that. Just have a look around. Those are the two best ways. Yeah. Well, thank you once again for spreading the love, uh, for helping all of us to connect with and, and love all the sweet little parts of us. And of course, to connect with, appreciate, respect, uh, and give compassion to everyone around us because we all we all deserve even more of that. Thank you. We sure do.